Hey, Angelie, how are you? Oh, hi, Kayla. So sorry, I just had my headphones in. I was just catching up on the latest episode of Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond. Oh, I'm totally hooked. I just binge listened to the last three episodes. The inspiration it has always gets me through my day. I know. Between the entrepreneurs, CEOs, best selling authors, thought leaders, amazing speakers, and famous people and personalities, there is just so much great content. Right? Lou really taps into the heart and soul of the guests and totally decodes how they are able to thrive. Yeah, which interview do you like most? Oh gosh, that's impossible to choose. I know, I'm trying to pick. How about favorite question? Your, Your all-time, all-time favorite, favorite movie? <laughs> <laughs> Gotta run, Angelie. Keep on listening. Check you later, Kayla, and thrive loud. Get ready to thrive loud with Lou Diamond. Welcome everyone to another episode of Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond. Connecting you to the most exciting and amazing people that are thriving each and every day. I'm your host Lou Diamond. Today on Thrive Loud, we have a man obsessed with helping people take the leap across the gap that exists between potential and results. He is the host of the popular Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do podcast and has interviewed hundreds of business leaders about success. He has had an eclectic career in sales and marketing for Fortune 500 companies, law firms, and small companies. He has written 12 books, 12 books, we're going to talk about that, and a long time ago, he was a five-day returning champion on the $25,000 Pyramid Game Show, and judging by that time a long time ago, maybe he got to meet Dick Clark. That could be cool. Anyway, he's a guy that might need to pack an extra set of clothes for his next speaking gig. Otherwise, he'll end up with a college t-shirt and a pair of shorts. Thrive Loud listeners, Tom Singer. Tom, how are you today? Lou, I am doing great. And that is funny because I am wearing the same clothes today (laughs) as I was wearing yesterday because I missed that flight. It's, uh, it's an interesting uh, gig that we have when you pop around all over the place and you, know, you need to plan accordingly and every now and then you run out of clothes. It I does tra- happen. I travel about 100 nights a year and have been doing so for multiple years and this is the first time I've ever missed a flight. Wow, amazing. So that's actually impressive and, and the reason you missed it was your, your own time. It, wasn't, it was your own issue, right? That's, I, as I, I understood I, it. I totally screwed up. I thought my flight was at nine. My flight was at seven. Fortunately, I, was, I figured it out like at seven o'clock while I was with my daughter who lives in Chicago. So I stayed with her and her fiance. It didn't cost me anything. And I got a little extra time with uh, my kid and my future son-in-law. So it, it, was, it was all good, but uh, it screwed up today. But I'm here. So Thrive Loud listeners, we need to know that it is very important that our guests have their priorities set and that they will literally jump through hoops and and make planes at the last minute to make sure that they can come on this program. And that's exactly what Tom has done. So, so Tom, what I do want to do is I want to talk about success because you're obsessed with talking about success (laughs) and figuring out the cool things that people do and specifically entrepreneurs. So uh, I gave the high level of your bio, but I really want to understand where that focus of yours comes from, because I know you speak about it too. So about three years ago, I realized I'd hit a plateau in my career. I've been working as a professional speaker. It's the only way I make money. I speak at company meetings and at association conferences, and it's all I've done for 10 years. And I do anywhere from 40 to 50 events a year, and I'm I'm popping on planes and usually making them on time. And (laughs) About three years ago, I had hit a plateau. My business had grown year over year for the six years leading up to that. And I sort of hit this plateau and I felt inside of me that I had more potential, but I realized that so what? Potential wasn't getting me any results. Potential unto itself was not performance. And I started talking to people about this and I I sort of opened up Pandora's box because once I could get people to open up and some people were people I knew very well, some people were those in my industry, some were people sitting next to me on the airplane. And yes, I am that guy who will talk to you on the airplane. And (laughs) when people would open up, most people told me, yeah, I always thought I would be doing more. I thought I'd own my own business or I would be make partner in the law firm faster or whatever it was. And and when they would open up saying, you know, I'm just not necessarily 100% there. Now, some of these people were really successful, but they believed they could and should be doing more. And I, I resonated with that. So I formally started studying and I started researching this and interviewing people and asking questions and doing follow ups. And what I realized was that if all these people have this feeling that, hey, I've got so much potential, 
but they don't feel they're getting there. It can be depressing. It can hold people back. They feel stuck in this sort of high middle. And so I started interviewing people who were really successful and asked them, how did you get farther across that gap than some people? And they sort of wrote the, the information for me. I mean, it was the answers from hundreds of interviews with really successful people really gave a lot of the same answers. And none of it was rocket science. It was all simple things that people did who were really, you know, kicking butt. And so, uh, yeah, I've gotten a little bit obsessed with it. Thrive Up listeners, a uh, little background information. Tom and I were just at a conference in San Diego with some other pretty awesome people. And we obviously recognize that cool things entrepreneurs do and Thrive Loud does kind of overlap in certain ways in the sense that we're trying to figure out what makes these people really successful in what they do. And I wanted to jump in here, Tom, and ask you, in those common things that you've seen, I want to hear from you, what's one of the most surprising things that you've heard from your guests on your program that may have even changed the way you think about certain things and the way you approach your business as well? So I don't know if it was necessarily surprising, like, whoa, I never would have thought of that. However, the one that has changed my life in the last three years was really successful people told me, look, I'm willing to go out and try things. And they used different words. They talked about taking risks. They talked about shaking it up. And I remember somebody told me, and I don't remember exactly who it was, but he said, look, you know me, you know of me because of this company. What you may not realize is it's my like seventh attempt at entrepreneurship. Hmm. And he had sold a company early on and then several of them, he took some venture money and had to give it back or it failed. Uh, a couple others did okay. A couple, you know, one went bankrupt and on his seventh or eighth try, he put all the pieces together. And he said, if you're not out there trying, if, if when something goes your way, you think, oh, I must do it this way. I systematize everything and I never try anything new because I want to just repeat the success. He goes, you're never going to have that big success. So this idea of try new things has become sort of my personal motto. And where I used to, I discovered about myself, I would not do things unless I was pretty sure I could succeed. So that's jobs I took, that's hobbies I did, that's uh, vacations I went on. I always looked at what was sort of the safe way that was in my comfort zone. And three years ago, I just said, screw my comfort zone. And I started doing different things. And it's really, you know, it's really had an impact, not only on my career, but on my, my personality and my, my personal life too. Yeah, I, I've always believed you need to fail. You need to, that, that's part of winning is knowing how you failed. And, and it's true. When you get the successful person on your program or on the stage or, you know, you hear them talk about their successes or you read about them in magazines, you only get that tip of the iceberg. You, you miss the whole foundation that built them, which was all the mistakes they made. I, I love talking about the minor pivots that people make, like these little adjustments, these minor changes that actually led to the success. Like they went down one path, but recognized there was an offshoot of another. You well, see that a lot? Yeah. And the one that really impacted me was like the first thing I did, like when I first said, okay, I'm going to try things that are out of my comfort zone. Somebody said, we were in Las Vegas. They said, oh, you should jump off the stratosphere. There's this 108 story yeah. outdoor jump. And I was like, no, I'm actually very scared of heights. And I'm kind of a weenie about it. And I was like, oh, no. And they're like, aren't you the person who's exploring all this, try new things? And I'm like, oh, God, you hate it when people you know, throw your own research back at you. And uh, so I did it. And I lived through it. And I did almost you know, crap my pants. But I, I, I did it. <laughs> but then when I got the opportunity to go zip lining in Costa Rica, I did it. Whereas before I probably wouldn't have, because I, I jumped off the stratosphere, I could zip line. Right. And uh, the biggest change was I got challenged a year and a half ago by a friend of mine who he's a professional speaker. He talks about humor in the workplace and he's also a professional comic. Oh, uh, I know who I we're was, talking about. <laughs> we're, this is Andrew Tarvin. Uh, he, Drew, Drew's an, a very famous guest at Thrive Loud. So I want to hear that he got you to get up and do stand up. So Drew, I was coming to New York and nice. we were kind of new friends at the time about a year and a half ago. And I said, hey, I'll be in New York for a few nights. And he goes, oh, we overlap one night. I'm going to open mic night that with me. Come with me. And I said, oh my God, Drew, I would love to watch you work on new material. I love going to comedy shows and have since I was a teenager. I've never been to an open mic night. And he said to me, that's not what I'm inviting you to do. And I was like, oh no, 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 no. I'm 51 years old at the time. Like, There's no way I'm going to do stand up at a club in New York City. And he goes, look, I'm not going to push you, right? He goes, I'm not going to make you do it, but why not? And, and I pondered it for a few days and I called him back and I said, okay, here's the date I'm there. If it works for you, we'll go. And I met him at this comedy club in Greenwich Village 
we signed up and my name got drawn and I got up and did a five minute, a five minute stand up set. I, I can't believe you didn't call me when you were in town, but we're going to keep going. You did a five minute set and how did you feel? Uh, well, first of all, I'm going to be back next month. So I'll call you. All right. So we, we got to coordinate. Okay. But, keep but going. what happened was, is like, it, I, I was okay. Like, the comics were like, wow, that was your first time. That was really good. But I've given 900 speeches. So my, well, I wasn't that funny per se, my stage presence, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't petrified. Right. And then what happened is I realized by pushing myself, I learned something. So when I got back to Austin, I told my wife, I'm going to do a hundred open mic nights. And she's nice. like, what, what does that even mean? I go, I don't know. I'm just going to find a way. <laughs> I travel a lot. I'll just Google open mic night and yeah. go in cities. And fast forward a year and a half later, I've now done 75 open mic nights. Go you. And the byproduct is I'm a better speaker on stage. I was obviously good enough before. I was of course. It, but my repeat clients are like, what has happened? You are so much more playful. It's not that I'm even funny. It's that I'm just willing to put myself out there, be courageous, and play with the audience in a way that I didn't do for the first 10 years of my career. All right. So Thrive Lab listeners are going to get an extra bonus thing here. First of all, Drew Tarvin, his Humor That Works uh, episode was hysterical. In fact, we actually did a mini-sode of his episode as well. So he's, he's had the, the floor on Thrive Lab twice. <laughs> and this is the part you'll appreciate. Uh, Thrive Lab listeners, in the middle of September, Tom and I were at a conference in San Diego there was some open mic type of thing that was going on. I said, the last time I spoke to Drew, Drew told me, you know, the next time you get a chance to do it, you should come. And I said, you know what? I want to go do it. So I didn't really have any planned comedy bit or jokes, but I just wanted to tell a story because I did want to work on practicing telling a funny story. And that's what I did. So the first person I texted, Tom, and actually someone had a video clip of me getting on stage at that conference in San Diego was Drew. And it was awesome because he's like, all right, now we got to get you back in New York and do that event. So maybe we'll collide and, and meet up there. But that's I'm gonna, awesome. I'm going to be there for five nights in October and uh, I'm going to be with my wife. But one night I get to go to open mic night while I'm in New York. So uh, Thrive Up listeners, we'll put this as a promise. We, maybe we'll do some social media uh, clicking and pictures, but we'll, we'll make sure that Tom and I are in the same place. But that's awesome. And that's great that you're stepping into those shoes and doing that. Kind of crazy, yeah, right? It, 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 has, it has really changed me and I, I've experienced a lot of things and some of it not necessarily great, but I've learned a lot, a little bit anyway, about like d uh, diversity and inclusion because yeah. when I go to a business event, I mean, let's face it, I look like the bank president. People always, <laughs> come up, people always come up in a business setting and talk to me. But in these comedy clubs, these comics, most of them are 25. A lot yeah. of them have, you know, kind of alternative lifestyles or, or just they're very different than me. And they, they have more tattoos is really what it is. They yeah. have a lot more tattoos. They yeah. wear black clothing and they're all skinnier than I am. But they, <laughs> they, they don't talk to me. Like when I go into a club, you know, and I like try to make small talk, they're like, who brought their dad? Right. And it took me a long time sort of in the Austin comedy scene to get anyone to be like, oh, it turns out he's a normal, you know. 53 year old white guy. Uh, it took a long time for people to talk to me. And so now I am more conscious when I'm at a business event and somebody feels like they're on the outside, they're standing on the edge. Uh, I went up to a gentleman the other day and he had dreadlocks and I walked up and I said, Hey, how you doing? Why'd you come to this event? We started having this conversation. And the next day he came back up to me and said, you were the only person who really talked to me last hmm. night. How, how come? That's great. And I said, cause I try to make people feel included. And, and that's a, a sort of a byproduct of what I learned being the outsider for the last year. Tom, if doing stand-up has improved your awareness and your ability as a speaker on stage, what has podcasting done for you? Well, for one, you know, podcasting has been the greatest networking tool I've ever encountered because if you meet somebody interesting and you say, hey, would you like to be on Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do? Most people say yes. And so it's opened up a lot of doors for me. The other thing is, is that it's made me a much better interviewer. Yeah. And part of my speaking work is I, I'm the master of ceremonies for like association conferences, like their annual event, and they'll have me year after year. And so one of the things I've added into my package is, is I can interview your speaker after they do the keynote. So instead of giving them, you know, an hour, give them like 50 minutes and then I'll come out on stage and I'll have them go a little deeper. And it's worked out every single time. Sometimes the speakers don't like the idea, but afterwards they're like, wow, that was like fantastic. And I never could have done that if I hadn't done 500 episodes of my show. I, I'll add a similar thing is I, I interact a lot in the audience when I speak and the ability to listen from podcasting has helped me do that aspect of what I do on stage or technically in the audience better. 
So I, I can imagine that that skill of, of yours between the ears definitely helps. Very cool stuff, man. Look at this, Tom. Look at us connecting here on the show, even though we didn't know all this stuff. Isn't that impressive? <laughs> so, so uh, Tom, when you speak and you MC, I'm going to ask that question. You speak, you MC, and you've written a gazillion number of books, 12 books. Which do you like doing best? You know, it's, that's like saying, which of my children do I love more? Yeah, but we know the answer to that question. We always have one that we love more. We just don't tell everybody about it. <laughs> I was going to say, if you, if, you ask, if you ask Jackie, she'll say it's Jackie. If you ask Kate, she'll say it's Kate. I, I, right. I fooled them both. Uh, the, the truth is, though, that uh, I, I think I'm a keynoter first. You know, early on in my career, someone told me there are, are, there are writers who speak and there are speakers who write. Oh. I was definitely a speaker who wrote. Very cool. I love to ask this question to the guests that come on the show because I'm very curious. So you're doing all these great things. And obviously, even on days, you know, you might forget which plane to go on or which airport to go to. You know, you have an off day. When you have trouble thriving, Tom, who or what practice do you seek to get back on the thriving track? So fortunately, you know, I, I, I feel like I always can pull it off on stage, right? I always can like find that, that, that inner energy to, to get out there and deliver what I have to do. But sometimes afterwards, you know, I can, I can sort of crash and I don't want to do sort of the work that I have to do. I'm a solopreneur, so I have to do the accounting. You know, I have to finish my taxes. I have to do that stuff. And, you know, what I have found is of late, I've really just sort of embraced really sort of finding the right energy. So I've never been a big music guy. A lot of people are really into bands and stuff like that. But of recent, I've found that like, if I can just listen to music, I can kind of find the energy. I can tap into some sort of a higher power, some sort of a buzz that's out there. And if I can do that for like a half hour, then I can sit down and, and focus. So I, I sometimes have to just sort of kick myself in the ass and say, okay, just sit here and meditate and think and think about what you have to do and then go do it. Nice. I like that. Simple, task oriented, make it happen. All right. Starting starting to learn more about you. Still haven't figured out why you never pack enough clothes, but we'll get to that in a minute. Let's do the admin part. Get this out of the way because we're going to have a fun bit for the rest of the show here. Share with the listeners all the places people can find you, websites, links, et cetera, podcast info. I'll put it all in the show notes with my team, but it's always better when they hear it from you. You know, uh, everything is Tom Singer and I spell it T-H-O-M-S-I-N-G-E-R. It's like Thomas without the ass. Uh, so it's Tom, it's TomSinger.com is my website and on social media at almost everything. I'm just at Tom Singer, T-H-O-M-S-I-N-G-E-R.com. And my, uh, my podcast is called Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do. Follow-up question for you, Tom. What was the coolest thing you learned an entrepreneur has done? Oh, wow. Um, that is a, I should have prepared for that question. That, that's like, boom, that's everything that's sort of out there. You know, I, I think the greatest stories that I like, so you and I were at this podcasters conference and we were essentially watching people pitch to possibly be guests on the show. And there was a lot of people there who worked for themselves. And so a lot of them felt like, oh, well, I work for myself. I can be on cool things entrepreneurs do. But many of them were just starting their business or they were like really pure solopreneurs and, and things like that. And I really look for the story arc. So I love the people who got like a law degree or an MBA who then became like a spiritual body healer. Or I like the people who started a business and went bankrupt three times and mm. then became a millionaire. So I think the coolest thing when I interview people on my show is I love the story arc. And so to me, the cool part is that no two people I've interviewed and, you know, there's 500 shows, there's probably about 400 of them are interview shows. And I probably, you know, there's no two who had the exact same path. And I think that's the coolest part. I like it. I like breaking it out that way. A couple more questions here because we're going to have fun. Uh, let's get the signature Thrive Loud question out of the way. What's your all-time favorite movie? Star Wars. And why does that movie connect with you? So there's a couple of reasons. The main reason is I was 10 years old when Star Wars came out. So I realize a lot of people listening were like, wait a minute, Star Wars came out 20 years before I was even born. <laughs> I remember the hype for this movie, right? It was just supposed to be this little, you know, kind of wonky, you know, science fiction movie. And it came out and it just exploded. It was like weeks and weeks on the screen. People were lining up. I mean, this is in the day that we didn't, we were just getting like mall multiplex theaters where you'd have like seven movies in one place. 
where I grew up, and I grew up in the suburbs of LA, every city, every suburb had like a movie house that sat like thousand people. I mean, they were big and, you know, they weren't these little cut-ups of theaters that sat a hundred in each room and recliners. These were like big auditoriums where they were giant screens and like, you know, Dolby sound was just coming out or whatever it was called at the time. And I remember like you, you had to stand on, you couldn't buy tickets online. And so we waited a few weeks because the lines were so long. And then when, when, you know, maybe it had been out like three weeks, my brother who was 14 years older than I am, he told my parents he'd take me because my parents were like, why do we want to go see this space bang bang movie? Hmm. And so my brother took me and I remember we stood in line and, you know, he bought me popcorn and the large Coke. And then the movie itself, I mean, it's, if you really dissect it, it's just the hero's journey. I mean, the movie is, yeah. we've seen that plot a thousand times, but to a 10 year old, it was, it was new. And to a 10 year old, those characters, right? I mean, Luke and Han and Leia and, and everybody else, it, it was unreal. And so it just, it was captivating to me at 10 years old. And then you go forward and just see how it's become sort of this huge part of, of our culture. Um, the combination of those two things. I just, I just think for me, it was a life changing movie and I, I'm always rooting for the underdog and, you know, Luke and Leia and, and, and them were, they were the underdog. I'll say this. Uh, I know that the last, the ninth movie is coming out or the last of whatever this, you know, yeah. <laughs> these three trilogies is and, coming until out. Until they want to make a few more billion. It's, they, it's the last one until they want a few more billion dollars. Exactly. Not counting those rogue movies and those other Han, you know, solo movies that kind of are offshoots. Um, the last one's coming up in a couple months at the time of this recording. We're doing this late September and it's coming out right around Christmas time. And I still like that. I was, I was a little, I'm a little younger than you. I was seven when it came out. Uh, the, the sound of the, those instruments, opening you know dun, and you know dun, 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 and, the, and the scrolling the scroll the, 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 I mean that was like how did they do that the scrolling yeah. font going through space was amazing yeah I was I was liked in the movie Spaceballs when they make fun of that component at the end of it like and <laughs> they show a ship that goes on and on and on, and on. <laughs> but uh, but I just to see that I'm still as excited to go see it as I was all those years ago so I oh, totally oh yeah, and and you know, there's always the big thing in our society: is it Star Wars or Star Trek? I love right. them both, and can't wait for the next Star Trek movie. <laughs> I'm with you on that, especially this new generation they think they did in this alternative universe. It's kind of cool. oh yeah, it's awesome. Big big fan. Uh, now I want to jump into this this question that's been burning since I read it in the intro. So you were a five day returning champion on the twenty five thousand dollar pyramid game show. Can can you share a little more info on this? So I lived in a fraternity house in college and I was always an early riser. So in a fraternity in college, that meant I was up by nine in the morning. And, uh, you know, nowadays I'm up at six, but back then I was up at nine, but nobody else was. And I would, you know, get some coffee and I would go sit in the TV room and I would turn on the TV and we, I, I would watch the $25,000 pyramid by myself. And what I'd do is I'd position the recliner where my foot would block the word and I would play along. But the problem is, you know, you talk, your show's called Thrive Loud. That should be my show because I have a loud voice. Yes. I don't know. It was after a week or a month. One day, this guy, Don, comes out of his bedroom and he's like, dude, what do you do out here every morning? And he thought, he goes, do you have like Tourette's? Because all he would hear is me. <laughs> he's I, shouting I, out words. <laughs> I, I had the TV low so it wouldn't disturb anybody. So I could barely hear it. But then I'd be like, elephant, giraffe, rhinoceros. And I would scream out the answers and I go, oh, I'm playing along. So Don started coming out. He was also an early riser. He'd study in the mornings. He started coming out every morning. And one day he goes, you're cheating. Your foot's not, there's no way. So he made, put a piece of cardboard over it and I kept playing and he'd spin me around when they go to the bonus round so that I couldn't see the thing. Cause he thought I was cheating and right. I would just do it. And one day Don goes, that's it. We're calling. Cause at the end of those shows, they used to say, if you're going to be in the Los Angeles area, we'd like to be a contestant, call this number. Right. I went to college in San Diego. So I was two hours away. I had a car. Don's like, you're trying out. And so I thought, oh, that'd be fun. And so I, I tried out and I got selected to be a contestant. It wasn't college week. It was just regular old, you know, game show day. And uh, I was a five-day returning champion. I won $20,000, a trip for two to Brazil, a sailboat, and a stereo. That is amazing. And by the way, what, was that when Dick Clark was the, the oh, host? Yeah, baby. Oh, Clark that, all the way. That is spectacular. Um, hold on. I'm giving the, the claps up here. That is, that, is a, that is an amazing story. I love that. <laughs> 
<laughs> Dun -dun -dun. I, I now know what the producer is going to play as we finish off this episode. It's playing underneath us now, man. But thank you so much for coming on Thrive Loud. Tom Singer, I'm going to see you on stage. I'm going to hear you on Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do. And the two of us are going to go to some open, open mic comedy club and, and hang with Drew Tarvin and try to be funny. Sound like a plan? Sounds like a plan. Thanks again for coming on the show today, Tom. Thank you. And to all our Thrive Lab listeners out there, thank you for joining us. And until next time, keep thriving onward and upward. And remember, be brief, be bright, be gone. You've been listening to Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond, you lucky person you. As long as you're not a weirdo, make sure to subscribe on iTunes, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please, I'm begging you, we're really cool. Also, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Come on, I know you all have those social media platforms and you use them on the daily. If not, find us on the web at thriveloud.com. It was nice thriving with you and see you next time.